We're ready to go on with the third talk. You certainly heard two um, very different but very wonderful presentations, and I'm hoping this third talk will tie a lot of this together as we begin to talk about a specific issue, and that is prostate cancer screening. Uh, I know many of you in the audience have a very personal uh, interest in this topic. Um, I noticed Dr. Moyad left one pill on the podium. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to know what that pill is, and would you be brave enough to take it? I don't know. I think I'm, I think I'm not going to take it, actually. All right. Um, I want to talk to you today about something called the quantum theory of prostate cancer screening. And I subtitled it, How I Learned to Love Epistemic Ambivalence. I kind of hearken back to the 1964 movie, Dr. Strangelove, and you'll remember the subtitle, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. The reason I picked this topic or title is I think we're in a little bit of a cold war right now with regards to prostate cancer screening. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the arguments on both sides of that. All right. Let's talk about the story of prostate cancer screening. Uh, back when I was at Parkland from 1977 to 1987, prostate cancer was something we hardly ever talked about. It's something we saw in the clinic, and about 80% of the time when we discovered a man with prostate cancer, it was already incurable at the time of initial diagnosis. We would do a rectal exam and find uh, a mass in the prostate or the patient would have a fracture of one of his bones and be found on x-ray to have a characteristic type of lesion in the bone that came from the prostate. What changed and what made a difference was the introduction in the mid-1980s of a blood test called prostate-specific antigen. PSA or prostate-specific antigen uh, is something that's produced only by prostate cells. Nothing else in the body makes it. It would be wonderful if it were only produced by prostate cancer cells, but it's produced by all prostate cells, cancerous or otherwise. Well, what you can see happened was uh, we suddenly went from an incidence of 111 per 100,000 to an incidence um, of nearly 230,000, or an incidence of um, about 230 per 100,000 in just five or six years. And the reason for that is we started diagnosing a pool of men who had early indolent prostate cancer. In other words, prostate cancer that wasn't growing very fast. They had no symptoms. They were out there all along, but we just came up with this test to give us an idea of who is at increased risk, and then we started biopsying everybody who had an elevated PSA. And it quickly resulted in diagnosing a huge population of men with prostate cancer. So over time, what happened was um, we started to treat those men, and we started to run into the opposite problem, which was we were starting to get complications and harms from treatment in men who might not have ever needed to be treated. And that became more and more obvious as time went on. So once we drew down that initial pool of men who were out there but really weren't having any problems, we got back to a more stable incidence of prostate cancer, and then in about 2007, 2008, a couple of things happened. One is the United States Protective or Preventative Services Task Force, you heard them mentioned before, came out with a recommendation that said men should not be screened for prostate cancer at all, neither with a PSA test or with a digital rectal exam. And they should not even be screened if they have an increased risk of prostate cancer, including being African American or having uh, relatives with prostate cancer. They said across the board, men should not be screened. The other thing that happened was we started to do something called active surveillance for men with prostate cancer, which means once we made the diagnosis, we chose to try to defer therapy and watch those patients until there was evidence that the disease was progressing. 
the reason it looks like the incidence is going down may not necessarily be because the incidence is really going down. It may be because the reporting is going down. Because a couple of things happened. Urologists started opening their own pathology labs and they would send the biopsies to their own pathologist. But those pathologists may not be reporting a positive biopsy to the National Cancer Database or even to the state. And so we probably have a true under-reporting of the incidence of the disease at this point. This was the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommendation. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends against prostate cancer, I mean against PSA based screening for prostate cancer. The potential benefit does not outweigh the expected harms. That's a strong statement. And, you know, the target for that really wasn't the urologist. The target was the primary care physicians and the internist. And uh, some of them took it to heart. A recent survey uh, after this came out showed that about 20 to 40 percent of uh, family practice doctors and internists had stopped doing routine screening. That means about 60 percent are still doing it. So what is the natural history of prostate cancer? We know that one in seven men will ultimately be diagnosed with prostate cancer during their lifetime. And of that one of seven, one of six of those will actually die of the disease. Therefore, only one in 39 men will die of prostate cancer. Furthermore, we know that the risk of dying from prostate cancer if it's confined to the prostate when it's first diagnosed is 0% at five years. It's almost unheard of to die within five years, even without treatment, if the disease is localized when first diagnosed. Even the risk of death at 15 years is only 15% without treatment. So those are compelling arguments against um, treatment, but not necessarily against screening. I'll explain why. We've had a shift in management strategies for prostate cancer since 2003. At that time, as you can see, we were roughly splitting treatment between surgery and radiation with active surveillance accounting for only about 7% of everyone who was diagnosed. And most of those were people who were elderly or infirm for a number of other reasons and were not thought to be good candidates for active treatment. By 2015, it's estimated that up to 40% of patients are at least initially undergoing active surveillance before going on to some more definitive form of treatment. And I didn't put in cryotherapy or high-intensity focused ultrasound, but they're a much smaller slice of the treatment pie. What is active surveillance? We've got to define it. You know, there's a difference between active surveillance and uh, watchful waiting. In watchful waiting, the idea is that you're going to make the diagnosis, but you don't ever intend to treat the patient with the intent to cure. You intend to watch the patient and manage side effects and symptoms when they occur, but you have no intent of curative therapy. Active surveillance is different. Active surveillance, you make the diagnosis, and then you try to defer active therapy until you have definitive evidence of progression of disease, or you have evidence that uh, the patient's got impending progression of disease. And then you still try to treat the patient with the intent to cure or control the disease. That's the difference. So when you say active surveillance, that's what you mean. Right now, at least 20% of the people who start on active surveillance go on to some form of management uh, within two years. And by five years, 40% of the people who started out being under active surveillance have gone on to some form of definitive therapy. What are the risks and harms of the treatment of prostate cancer? Well, we've been, I'm going to try and, try, try and tie some of these talks together. Cost is one of the things. Uh, cost is a major component of the treatment of prostate cancer, and you can see how they uh, fall out here. Standard radiation therapy, about 31,000. Uh, combined radiation therapy with seeds and external beam therapy, about 36,000. Compared to brachytherapy, which is just seeds, and then open prostatectomy and robotic prostatectomy. Uh, interestingly, CMS just cut the reimbursement for robotic prostatectomy by 33%. 
so as it becomes more utilized, and this is a recurrent theme with CMS in Washington, something that got high utilization is overpriced. Seriously, they, come, they have come out and said that very clearly. So if they see something being done a lot, they're going to start paying less for it. And that's just the fact of life we're going to have to deal with. The other harms are quality of life harms. So with surgery, of course, there's some risk of urinary incontinence and sexual dysfunction. With all forms of therapy, there's some risk of psychosocial um, dysfunction, depression, uh, things like that. And then finally, there's some risk of secondary malignancy with radiation therapy. This has been debated quite a bit, but there's some reasonably good recent studies that do show an increased risk of developing a secondary bladder or rectal cancer if you've been definitively radiated for prostate cancer. And what that means to us, those of us who are taking care of prostate cancer patients, is we have to be aware that if somebody has microhematuria, for instance, on follow-up, that this could very well represent uh, a bladder tumor. So that's one thing that we need to screen for. I wanted to just show you uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians has come out and said do not routinely screen for prostate cancer using either a PSA test or a digital rectal exam. Now, I sort of understand um, the PSA argument. Why not a rectal exam? Well, the reason is many studies have shown that the finger, while very sensitive, is, very, is not very specific. In other words, there's a lot of things you find on rectal exam that aren't cancer. But it adds no incremental cost to the exam, so why not do a rectal exam since we know that prostate cancer can exist even when the PSA is normal? So they've said don't do either. Furthermore, they said in a man with a life expectancy of less than 10 years, uh, screening is discouraged not only not recommended, but discouraged. So I know we have a number of uh, physicians and primary care physicians in the room, and I presume that these are the guidelines that they're getting from their own organizations. So let's talk about that. What if you wanted to follow guidelines? Well, there's some tricks to that. There's some things you have to figure out if you're going to follow those guidelines. One is you have to figure out which populations are at risk. You need an accurate way to assess somebody's actuarial survival. And then you need to confirm the need for evaluation. We'll take them one at a time. Uh, what populations are at risk? Well, if you're African American in North America, then you have a 1.6 increased odds ratio of getting prostate cancer over your Caucasian and um, Hispanic uh, members, co-members of society, just, just on the basis of being African American. If you've got a first degree male relative with prostate cancer, either your father or your brother, then you have a two times increased risk over the general population. And if you've got two first degree relatives, you're at five times over the general population. It's currently thought that only about 15% of men with prostate cancer have the familial or hereditary form of prostate cancer. The other 85% are thought to be spontaneous. I think that number is going to rapidly change as we have a better and better understanding of which genes actually are participating in this. It's not going to be one gene. There isn't going to be a, a prostate cancer gene. There's going to be 20 or 50 or 100 prostate cancer genes. Some other risk, obesity. You heard uh, Dr. Moyad talk about obesity in general as being a risk factor. We think it probably increases your risk of advanced prostate cancer by about 10%. It's less clear what the role is in primary prostate cancer. But then there's some other uh, interesting propositions such as chronic prostate infection and as yet unidentified viral etiologies. In other words, it may be a virus that inserts some bit of DNA or RNA into human cells that may play a role in this. And we don't know what that viral vector may yet be, although it's been speculated that it could be something as common as human papillomavirus or even the herpes virus. We don't know what viral vector may play a role. <clears throat> 
So this is uh, one of the trickier things in there, and this is uh, how do you figure out how long someone's going to live? Well, it's not so easy. So if you just take American males as a group um, and look at the life expectancy starting at age 60, it's 21 years. By the time you get to age 80, it's eight years. So if you're going to say, I'm not going to do screening on anybody who's got a life expectancy of less than 10 years, then you're going to have to go all the way out to the age of 76 or 77 before you stop screening the average male. Now, how you factor in diabetes, hypertension, obesity, other things makes that a much more difficult calculation. Uh, but to just set an arbitrary limit and say, I'm not going to screen anybody with a life expectancy of less than 10 years puts the onus on you to figure out what is a patient's actual life expectancy. All right, another simple trick for the, um, for the physicians in the audience. There's been a good study published that if you get an elevated PSA on a man who was hitherto in the normal range, if you just wait four weeks and repeat the PSA, more than a third of those people will have a PSA that reverts to the normal range. Historically, we used to give a trial of antibiotic therapy thinking that maybe the PSA was elevated because of an occult prostate infection. We've got good randomized double-blinded studies that now show empiric antibiotic therapy is not indicated unless the patient's symptomatic or in some way has objective evidence of a prostate infection. So it's really no longer standard of care to just give somebody six weeks of antibiotic therapy and then repeat their PSA. You're just as well off waiting a month or six weeks and repeating the PSA to see if it's reproducibly high. So we've got a lot of schemes for trying to improve the quality of what we can get out of our PSA testing, uh, age-specific reference ranges, PSA velocities, uh, free and total PSA, and PSA density. I won't go through all of those with you at length, but the PSA density, for instance, means the PSA divided by the prostatic volume. So we know that you can't estimate prostatic volume. Well, I can sometimes. But you can't ex estimate it very accurately by doing a digital rectal exam. You can be off by as much as 50% on the estimated volume of the prostate. But you can very easily measure prostatic volume by transabdominal ultrasound or transrectal ultrasound. So if you believe in PSA density, those are both ways to try and get the prostatic volume. And if you do it transabdominally, it's non-invasive. So that's an easy way to do it. PSA velocity we've been using now for several decades. And what you're doing there is we know that in a, in a healthy general population, the PSA is not going to rise more than 0.75 nanograms per milliliter per year under average circumstances. So if you see somebody with a PSA going up one and a half points in a year or two points in a year, you know that that's not likely to be on the basis of BPH alone. This is a little table of age-specific reference ranges, and what you'll see is it varies not only by age, but by ethnicity. So if you said, okay, I've got a 50-year-old African-American male, what would be expected uh, for that patient to be within the normal range? And it would be up to four. But if you take an Asian-American in the same age group, they should have a PSA no higher than three. So you can get some information about what's likely to be true for a population of patients in an age group and an ethnicity. And then you can do something called a free and total PSA. You know, the PSA circulates in the bloodstream and a percentage of that molecule is bound to a protein in the bloodstream. And some of it's not bound to a protein. That's the free PSA. So you can do a ratio of the uh, free PSA to the total PSA and get a percentage. You can then use that percentage to decide whether somebody's at an increase, a more increased risk or a less increased risk for prostate cancer. So if the free PSA is less than 15%, that's unfavorable. You're more likely to have prostate cancer. If it's greater than 25%, you're less likely to have prostate cancer. And you can see how it plays out by age group as well. So that can be another way to try and get a little more mileage out of the standard PSA test.
Let me give you a case before we do that. A 55-year-old man who has a PSA of five, it's been repeated and confirmed. And on digital rectal examination, he's got a one centimeter indurated nodule in the right lobe of his prostate. What's the correct management? Okay. Let me call on Dr. Kenneth Cooper. For those of you who don't know Dr. Cooper, the pioneer of aerobics, uh, he's here at the Cooper Clinic in Dallas. We're really honored to have him with us today. Dr. Cooper, what would you rate? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Cooper, what would you recommend for this 55-year-old man? Biopsy. Yep. It's the right answer. I knew he'd get it. Um, <laughs> Now, if you had that same 55-year-old man in your office, though, and you did neither a PSA or a rectal exam, you would have no clue that the patient probably has advanced disease. The reason I say that is when there's a palpable nodule in the prostate, we've known this for nearly 100 years, the odds of prostate cancer being present are at least 50%. If you combine that with an elevated PSA in a man of 55, then the odds are closer to 60 to 70% that he has prostate cancer. That allows me now to um, kind of have some fun. One of my uh, intellectual hobbies is particle physics. So I'm gonna relate a little bit of what's going on with the prostate cancer screening controversy to particle physics. Okay, Werner Heisenberg. Werner Heisenberg came up with something called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. For those of you who don't know much particle physics, um, let me just say that he kind of formulated this idea that if you're looking at a subatomic particle, it's going to have a pair of characteristics. And the more certainly you know one of those characteristics, the less certainly you will know the other. So if you're trying to figure out how fast the particle is going, you're going to have a much less good idea of where it is. And conversely, if you try and pin down where it is, you're going to have a much less good idea how fast it's going. That's the uncertainty principle. And it applies to what we just talked about with PSA testing. Because in PSA testing, we're setting an artificial threshold for these values. In other words, we're saying something over this increases your risk, something under that decreases your risk. So we're talking really about specificity and sensitivity. Specificity and sensitivity. The sensitivity means how likely you are to detect the cancer when it's really there. And the specificity is, if the test is abnormal, how likely is it there really is cancer to go with it? That's sensitivity and specificity. Well, these are these two things that we're going to have to play with. And we can set those thresholds anywhere you want. So for instance, if we set the threshold for the PSA value down to 0.1, then we, and we said, anybody over that we're going to test, we would capture 100% of the people with prostate cancer because everybody's got a PSA less than 0.1. Greater than 0.1. So if you do the opposite and you set the other side very high, then you're going to diagnose almost no one, very few. Okay, the ones you do biopsy, if their PSA is 50, are almost all going to have cancer but you're going to miss everybody underneath 50 and vice versa. So it's an example of trying to do specificity versus sensitivity. And that's what leads to this idea of epistemic ambivalence. Um, epistemology is the branch of philosophy that has to do with knowledge. So epistemic ambivalence in a way means just not knowing. Uh, and that's kind of what the task force has said. Let's just not know and live in a state of epistemic ambivalence. So if you choose not to screen and not to evaluate patients, you don't know if they've got it or not, right? It's kind of a happy state of not knowing. So that
brings us to the next physics principle. And uh, how many of you know the paradox of Schrodinger's cat? It's made recently famous on the Big Bang Theory. Um, but for those of you who don't know, um, there's a there's a thing in quantum physics called superposition. And what that says is that two particles can exist in simultaneous states at the same time, right on top of each other. And they don't assume one state or the other state until you try to figure it out. So that's why Schrodinger came up with this paradox to make it a little easier to understand. In Schrodinger's uh, opaque box, this is opaque. He put a live cat. And in the box with the live cat is a particle that can exist as a stable isotope, but can also become unstable and emit radiation. There's a detector so that if it emits radiation, this hammer falls and breaks a vial of hydrocyanic acid, which kills the cat immediately. So you start the experiment, you put the cat in there, and the box is opaque, soundproof, and you think about the cat. Is the cat alive or dead? Well, could be either, right? So he exists in a state of ambivalence where he's both alive and dead, until you open up the box to find out which one he is. So you can think about prost or you can think about your patients in the same way. As you talk to them, you can say the patient both has and does not have prostate cancer until I attempt to evaluate him. It's a paradox. And it leads to this thing called the many worlds theory. Uh, a lot of physicists believe that all of these other universes are parallel to ours. And depending on an event, you can either go into one universe or another universe, the many worlds theory. So here we've got the idea that you do PSA screening. That's one world. Because of that screening, you do a treatment to a patient who might not have needed to be treated, and that patient suffers harms related to the treatment. That's the worst of all possible worlds. That's supposed to be a supernova, for those of you who don't know. Um, if you do PSA screening and significant disease is found and cured as a result, that's the best of all possible worlds. Conversely, no PSA screening, the patient went on to die of other causes and never knew he had prostate cancer. That's the best of all possible worlds. Conversely, no PSA screening. The patient presents with a high PSA and metastatic disease and dies of disease which could have been cured if you had screened him at the beginning. So that's the problem we have. How do we figure out which decision to make? And it's exceedingly difficult, as you'll see. So prostate cancer, cancer management paradox since 1987, early diagnosis improved and death rates declined, but that led to overdiagnosis and overtreatment and decreased quality of life and increased cost to society in a certain percentage of those patients. So the problem is, do I screen or do I not screen? I had a professor, Dr. Paul Peters, at Southwestern Medical School, and any time I would start a an answer to him with, the problem is, he'd always say, Fulgham, the problem is in the mind of the clinician. And I think that's really true in this point, or in this particular case, because we're saying, what's the point of screening? What do I want to know, and why do I want to know it? I want to know if the patient has prostate cancer that's going to harm him so that I can fix it if that's the case. In the past, the process of knowing, there was only one way of knowing whether your patient had prostate cancer, do a prostate biopsy. That's still mostly true, although I'm very optimistic today because I'm going to tell you about some things that I think may change that paradigm for the first time in 20 or 30 years. The big problem with prostate cancer is 
This is a gross specimen of a prostate that's been removed. Here's prostate cancer. It's microscopic, not macroscopic. You can see it here under the microscope. And we've always used the microscope to try and predict the behavior of the disease. If the cells have a certain appearance under the microscope, we know they're more likely to spread. If they have a different appearance, we know they're less likely to spread. That's called the Gleason grade. Dr. Gleason's a pathologist, still living. Uh, that scale goes, historically, it went from 2 to 10. Now it goes from 6 to 10. 6 is the slow-growing kind. 10 is the fast-growing kind. And we know we can make some qualitative predictions about how likely it is the cancer will spread based on this. On ultrasound, prostate cancer is often darker than the surrounding prostate. We can also see it on um, MRI of the prostate. You see the dark area here. That's cancer. This dark area is cancer. But we still can't see down to that cellular level that tells us whether it's the more indolent variety or the faster growing variety. We still have that problem. We're perhaps getting close to being better. Prostate biopsy is not terrible. It's not great. Many of you have had a prostate biopsy. I'm sure your vote would, would count. Uh, some things we worry about are bleeding. With such a large percentage of the population now being on aspirin and platelet inhibitors for one or another reason, bleeding is a real potential risk. And 2% of people have enough bleeding that it's a problem after biopsy. Infection's also a problem. We've got antibiotics in all of the stuff we use and all of the products we eat and, all, and the, a lot of the livestock's being fed antibiotics. It's led to a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria so that people who get biopsied and get a certain kind of bacteria into their bloodstream from the biopsy may end up with infections that are uh, significant enough they have to be hospitalized for it. In fact, we've seen that number go up from 1% to the most recent report I heard was nearly 5% in some settings where significant infections occurred. Furthermore, we have the problem of a false negative result, meaning if I take your prostate and I stick a needle in it 12 times, I'm sampling less than 1% of the total volume of your prostate. If none of those pieces have cancer in them, I'm going to report to you that you have a negative biopsy for cancer. And yet, you could still have prostate cancer that I did not hit with my needle. That's a false negative biopsy. That's a sampling problem. So the way we've tried to get around that is to target areas of the biopsy that were suspicious on imaging or to do more biopsy cores. So if I take the same size prostate and I stick it 40 times, I've got a better statistical chance of hitting a cancer if it's present. But of course, there's a practical limit to that, as many of you can attest. Um, and then the last thing is the diagnosis of insignificant disease. And this is one of my little pet peeves. I hate the term insignificant disease. And I'll tell you why. Um, insignificant disease is defined as disease that's unlikely to do harm. Um, but it's very arbitrary how you define that. There's a flawed definition of insignificant. And it's in part due to the nature of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer tends to be a multifocal disease. It arises in multiple areas in the prostate at the same time. So the fact that you may hit an area of prostate cancer that doesn't seem to be very dangerous doesn't prove that there's not another area in the prostate that's more dangerous. In fact, the reason we know that's true is that up to 30% of the people we thought had what would have been called insignificant disease, if you take their prostate out and cut the whole thing up, they're then reclassified into significant disease 30% of the time. So the designation of insignificant uh, may not be accurate. So that leads to my next pet peeve, the thing called an unnecessary biopsy. Um, that's a really charged term, to use some of the political phraseology that's going around these days. To say something is unnecessary implies that it was done without much forethought and without much chance of it uh, helping you. I don't think that biopsies are unnecessary. For instance, using our current paradigm for deciding who should be biopsied, the positive biopsy rate's 
that's higher than almost any other solid tumor that gets biopsy, certainly higher than the positive biopsy rate for breast cancer. So a negative biopsy is not, necessar is not an unnecessary biopsy. But we do end up with problems associated with biopsy, and here's what they are. If you have a, a biopsy that's positive for cancer, and using my un, unfavorite term, insignificant, it looks like that up to 11% of patients who have a positive biopsy may have the kind of disease that would never need to be treated. We still don't know how to pick that out very well. So we end up over-treating those patients who might never have needed treatment. Furthermore, if you get a negative biopsy, we know that up to 20% of those are false negative. So we've got this group of men out there who've been told they have a negative biopsy when they're not really negative. And that changes people's approach to how often they're screened and how often they're rechecked. So it creates some problems for us when we don't have better information than just positive or just negative. So how can we make biopsies better? Uh, more careful selection of patients and targeting of biopsies based on ultrasound and MRI. One of the ways we can reduce complications and costs is reduce the number of cores we take. The other way, the other thing that does is reduce the likelihood of finding what's called insignificant disease. But here we run into that same problem again of specificity and sensitivity. If we start taking fewer cores, we're gonna diagnose fewer cancers, but we're gonna miss more significant cancers. If we take more cores, we're gonna diagnose more cancers, but we're also gonna diagnose more insignificant cancers. So we're trying to find that happy balance between the two. And if somebody has a problem with rectal bleeding, um, and we know they're at risk for that. Another thing we can do is use a transperineal biopsy where we actually go in the skin between the anus and the scrotum and stick the needle into the prostate without violating the rectal wall. That both decreases the risk of bleeding and decreases the risk of infection because you're not transiting the rectal wall when you stick the needle in. So those are some things that we're starting to do more of to try and make the biopsy less of a problem. Now, one of the things that I think will also help with cost as we go forward is getting more mileage out of ultrasound. There's right now a big love affair with MRI of the prostate. MRI of the prostate costs about $1,500. Transrectal ultrasound of the prostate costs about $130. And if we make better use of the ultrasound technology, we may be able to do about as well at diagnosing lesions with ultrasound as we do with MRI. So grayscale is the typical ultrasound that you get when you get looked at um, when you're pregnant. And that's the one we primarily use for prostate. We also add color Doppler, which looks at blood flow within the prostate. Remember, cancers tend to have more blood flow than benign tissue. Uh, what's on the horizon is contrast enhanced ultrasound where we can give you an injection of micro bubbles in the vein. When those bubbles circulate through the bloodstream and end up in the blood vessels in the prostate, the ultrasound waves shatter those bubbles and create an artifact called reverberation artifact, which we can see on the ultrasound. And that helps us target lesions better. And then finally, something called elastography. In elastography, we're looking at the fact that cancer cells tend to be more rigid than healthy cells. So if you push on them, they will have a different characteristic. The cancer cells won't compress as much as healthy tissue. And that actually can send out a secondary wave that can be measured with the ultrasound probe. It's called a shear wave. And it may provide yet another way for us to diagnose cancer on a completely different basis, which is its rigidity rather than how it looks under the microscope. That really would be a big innovation if it turns out to be as helpful as we hope. But right now, MRI is kind of center stage, and um, it's a very good imaging modality. The multi-parametric part, one parameter is called T2-weighted imaging, one parameter is called diffusion-weighted imaging.
The other is called dynamic contrast enhanced imaging. That's why it's multi-parametric MRI. And if you combine those three things together, it has pretty good sensitivity and pretty good specificity. Those two things we want to maximize if we can. So um, this is the part where I'm optimistic for the first time in a long time. Uh, sometimes I have the repetition of being, reputation of being rather dour, but in this case, I really am optimistic. Um, here's the new technology that's coming along that I think is going to help us. Pre-biopsy, what is the probability of prostate cancer being present? Okay, we've got the PSA and the digital rectal exam. But now we've got some products out there that may help us refine that number a little bit better. One's called the PHI or the PHI, the Prostate Health Index. That's a formula that looks at PSA and certain subcomponents of PSA and calculates a risk. So this risk is better than the general risk you can get from my PSA age-related tables. Cost about $80. There's another test out there called the 4K test, and this one uses PSA, free and total PSA, uh, intact PSA, and a thing called HK2, human calocrine 2. The PSA molecule is a type of molecule called a calocrine. So what you're doing is you're looking at a family of PSA-like molecules, and you're coming up with a profile. And from that profile, you're making risk assessments about how likely it is that prostate cancer is present. It's about $400 and not yet approved by some, in, in fact, I might say most insurances, but I think that's changing as we go along. Okay, so let's say you decide you do need to do a biopsy. If the PS, and the biopsy's negative, this addresses that false negative issue we were talking about. Let's say the PSA stays high after the biopsy or even goes up some more. Now what? Well, traditionally, it's been another biopsy. There's a test out there now where you can take the biopsy sample that was negative, and you can take some of that tissue, even though it's been fixed and put in paraffin, you can go back to it a year later, take that tissue out, and look at the genetic aspects of that tissue and try to come up with the probability that prostate cancer was present in the vicinity of the biopsy. You got that? So the biopsy is visually negative, but you want to know, could there be cancer right next to what I took? That's what that does. If the biopsy is positive, then you have to say, is this the bad kind or the good kind? The kind that's likely to hurt the patient or not hurt the patient? We had to depend on the Gleason grade before and the PSA. Now we've got a test that can look at the genetic characteristics of the cancer cells themselves and try to make a prediction about how likely it is the cancer will spread. That's a big deal if it gives you a pretty good sense of whether it will or won't. So just to answer, ask a couple of questions, how likely it is that you'll have a significant cancer present on your biopsy? If you do one of these tests beforehand, it will give you a number, a percentage, that will tell you how likely that is. And so, for instance, if your PSA was only minimally elevated and you did this test and it said the likelihood of you having the bad kind of prostate cancer is very low, you and your doctor may very well say, I don't want a biopsy yet. I think I'll take my chances and wait a few more months or years and see what happens over time. Conversely, if the biopsy is negative, but you still, you're very suspicious that cancer might really be there, this test may help push you toward that subsequent biopsy if it shows that your risk of having the bad kind is high. Okay, so the 4K score, just to take that as an example, this is something called a receiver operator curve, an ROC curve, and what you're doing is looking at specificity versus sensitivity. Remember we talked about those. And the way you evaluate the goodness of a test is what the area under this curve is. So a perfect screening test would have an area under the curve of 1.0. The test would always be right. 
If the tests were abnormal, you had cancer. If it were normal, you never had it. That would be a perfect test. And it would have an area under the curve of one. So any test that gets close to one is a good test. If it's 0 0.5 represented by this line, it's no better than flipping a coin. So what's the area under the curve for the 4K test for predicting the likelihood of metastatic disease within 20 years? Metastatic disease means it's spread. Well, the area under the curve is 0.83. That's a pretty good test. So if it says you're very unlikely to have metastatic disease within 20 years, there's a pretty good likelihood that that won't happen to you, and vice versa. So this may be a, a way to do a test one time on a patient who's in that age group between 70 and 75, where you say, do I really want to keep pursuing screening in somebody who's now close to the cutoff range of 10 additional years of life? That's just one way it might be used. To talk about this Confirm MD um, X, that's a product name, is a negative biopsy truly negative? This is looking at proteomic and epigenetic changes in the tissue in the biopsy. So here's the cancer right here. The biopsy went right next to it, but not through the cancer. This test is going to look to see if cancer is close by. That's what it's for. And then the Prolaris test, the Prolaris test is the one where you take cancer that was diagnosed on biopsy and say, what's the risk of dying if I don't treat this? And what this does is it looks at a bunch of different pathways in the cancer cells themselves to see whether it has the characteristics of the cancers that tend to spread or not. It's very expensive, but that information may be worth paying for in certain circumstances. And probably, as time goes by, the cost will come down. Uh, these things are things that are not yet paid for by insurance, so you have to deploy them very selectively and discuss them with the patient and decide whether that is worth paying for, that information is worth paying for. I'd like to finish just by going back to something that Dr. Wilfong mentioned, which is this Cancer Moonshot 2020. I don't know how, you, how many of you are familiar with that, but I was recently at our annual meeting in San Diego where we heard someone speak about this, and it's really quite exciting. Um, the genesis of it is that the technology that can be used now to analyze individual tumors has gotten so fast and so cheap that what used to take a year to do can now be done in 20 or 21 days, and that's to take tissue and actually do the entire genome of that tissue in 21 days. And what you're going to use that for is you're going to use that to find out who's going to respond to certain types of therapy. For instance, there are cancer clones of cells that aren't very responsive to hormone therapy, which has been the mainstay of our treatment for a long time. But there's a certain subclass of those cells that don't respond to hormone therapy. Well, if you could figure that out ahead of time, then you wouldn't waste your time and money and suffer the harms and risk associated with hormone therapy if it weren't going to be effective. And you can easily see how that can be extended to all kinds of cancers and all forms of treatment that are potentially toxic and harmful. So if you have a breast cancer that's not going to respond to the usual drugs, then you don't start with those drugs. That's really what we're in this age of individual therapy for cancer, and this is how we may be able to make that happen. Uh, it's so-called cancer on a chip, where you can reduce the signature of these cancers to certain characteristics, and then you can test against the actual cancer, not just prostate cancer, but Joe Smith's prostate cancer. And you can start to determine what treatments are likely to be helpful. It's going to help us do all sorts of designer drugs and develop liquid biopsies where we can actually do a tube of blood and be able to discern whether they're circulating cancer cells in the blood test, thereby avoiding having to take a biopsy and being able to determine from those cells what the characteristics of the cancer are likely to be.
so we know how aggressive we need to be in terms of therapy. It's very exciting. Uh, you know, 2020 may be a little optimistic, uh, but I really do see that it may move that way in the next 20 or 30 years to the point where a lot of the things we're talking about now uh, seem barbarous to be sticking needles through the rectal wall into the prostate. It's the best we have in 2016, but hopefully better times are coming. So, for the physicians in the audience, I would say annual PSA screening based on risk and life expectancy is the conversation you need to have with your patients. I disagree with the idea that you shouldn't even discuss it with the patient. Somehow the idea that the task force wants you to just avoid the topic makes no sense to me. Uh, people are certainly intelligent enough to make their own decisions about whether they want to undergo screening as long as they understand the risk and harms. So I would say that conversation ought to be had with every uh, patient. I think if you do PSA screening, you need to try and get the most mileage out of it you can by using age-specific reference ranges and free and total PSA and probably some of these other tests as they become less expensive. If you do get an, an isolated abnormal PSA, just repeat it. Wait four weeks and repeat it. And if it's still abnormal, then I'd refer to urology and we can uh, deploy the capabilities we currently have. For the patients in the audience, know what your risk factors are. I described those for you. Control your diet and body weight, hearkening back to Dr. Moyad's talk. Engage in a healthy lifestyle, including exercise. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Cooper would say that the right kind of exercise all through your life is gonna be good for you. Uh, even though you may have to scale it back a little bit with uh, aging in terms of joints and so forth. And then make PSA and rectal exam a part of your annual physical if you choose. I mean, this is up to you. You don't have to accept that the doctor isn't going to do it. Ask him to do it if you want to know that information. I've got some additional references that will be on the website if you want to look through those.